I'm delighted to be here in Dublin and delighted to talk about the ECN seen from a national perspective. Um, the ECN was created 1st of May 2004, so it turned five years old um, last year. And for those who have children of that age, it's still the tender age. Uh, you're not anymore a baby, so you walk, you talk, you smile, but you're not yet a teenager with all the difficulties of that age. So uh, I think about with nostalgia to, uh, to my daughters when they were only five years old. Um, in France, the creation of the ECN and Regulation 1 2003 was not, I would say, an intellectual revolution because our legislation entitled us to apply community law before 2004. So since 86, we were entitled and used to apply community competition law in our decisions, and that was ordinary work, I would say, our job, not daily, but I would say weekly uh, job. So that was not an intellectual revolution to think European. It was more, I would say, a cultural and manageable revolution to be part of this um, new European competition network. And if I take an image, if you allow me, I would say that before 2004, the Commission, the European Commission, was seen as a huge factory, in fact, producing competition decisions, competition law, and thanks, or in fact, because of the notification process the Commission had to absorb a lot of work which led to, I would say, European decisions applying competition law. And we, at the national level, we were, in a certain way, I would say, provincial observers of that factory. Uh, now, it has changed dramatically. Uh, we have a network of decentralized factories producing, each of them, community law decisions. And the Commission, instead of being a producer, is more and more a regulator, checking that this network is producing decisions which are consistent <coughs> with the other decisions made by the other ones. So the Commission is you know, switching from a producer role to a regulator role, and we, as national agencies, are more and more seen as part of the, of the building, I would say, as really... Um, uh, producers of a competition um, law. So that's a revolution in that, uh, in that sense. And the success was not obvious at the beginning. I remember I, I was appointed in 2004. There was a lot of skepticism when Regulation 1 2003 was adopted. Um, while many people were doubtful about the efficiency of the criteria of allocation of cases, is it really realistic to, uh, to adopt a such blurred criterion as the best place authority? And there was skepticism as well on the ability of C28 or 20, uh, well, yes, uh, agencies to produce consistent, uh, consistent uh, law, consistent uh, legal um, system. And five years and a half later, Everybody agrees now that the ECN has been a tremendous success, and I would try to explain why, to my view, uh, what have been the key elements of that success, and maybe to talk about the future challenges uh, lying ahead of us. And I think there are three important challenges we have to uh, face and to uh, meet in the, in the future to uh, guarantee that this success of today will be success of uh, tomorrow. First, um, the European Competition Network is a success because it has managed in five years to go beyond its national, its uh, primary, I would say, its initial objectives. The main strengths of the network is that it has become a gatekeeper, I would say, a must-go-through forum of discussion between enforcers. Sharing of views within the ECM has become a commonly used tool to efficiently take on the most informed enforcement actions as well as policy decisions by the NCAs and by the European Commission. Each week, for example, the French Autorité 
as all members of the network, it's consulted by several other ECN members to informally share uh, experience. For instance, on ongoing cases uh, for the requesting NCA to benchmark the solution envisaged at the national level. And it's something very new. Before 2004, we knew our colleagues, but we were not used really to share information, to talk about our cases, to, 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 to request information from others. Uh, that's quite new, and that's the result of this ECN experience. But the sharing of views also take the form of more formal contacts between all members through meetings at the ECN level, and I won't repeat what Alice uh, explained a few minutes ago. That was very uh, illuminating in the way it shows that there are different levels of meeting, different levels where we can share our experience. And you have been struck by the variety of items which are discussed today within the ICN. And well, many sectors are involved, like banking, energy, insurance, telecommunications, pharmaceuticals, or agricultural products. The sharing of views has also become an efficient tool to improve community legislation. And in this context, the consultation of the NCAs by the Commission has already proven solid results by taking into account national past experiences. And the best illustration of that is the current modernization of the vertical restraints regime. Um, if you uh, look at the number of decisions taken by the Commission on the base of the uh, 1999 vertical restraint regulation, there are very few, in fact. Uh, um, the European Commission is uh, focusing on big cartel cases and on Article 82 cases. But there are very few decisions based on the 1999 vertical regulation. Most of it, most of the work, is now done by the national agencies. And, for example, in France, we have calculated the number of decisions we have taken since 1999 on the base of that uh, community regulation. There are more than 40 cases, um, 40 cases. And, interestingly, most of them are on RPM cases, resale prime maintenance cases, and... A new and very stimulating item, which is how to conciliate online sales and distribu uh, dis uh, selective distribution networks. So, uh, we, it's, like, it's like, I would say, a Spanish inn. I don't know if you use that word in, in Irish. Uh, the Spanish inn is the place where you eat what you bring. And it's exactly the same for the ECM. You eat what you bring. And if you are able to bring your national experience, you can be much more influential in the way you design, I would say, uh, common rules. And, for example, on um, vertical regulation, we have been very instrumental and influential at the French level in designing the new rules because we had tested nationally that rules and proved that it was efficient and workable. So that's very, um, very um, important. The systematic sharing of views between ECN members, so is the key to its success, as it allows ensuring in real life its primary objectives guarantee a high degree of consistency in the enforcement of EU competition rules. But this also allowed to go even further, and I would like to explain that, and has sprung, I would say, a deeper convergence of national competition rules. Through this experience of this exchange of experience, the ECM has managed, and that was not, I would say, a ready-made result when we decided to go in that direction, has managed to inspire, I would say, a common culture of competition in Europe, and is now a must-go-through benchmarking tool, which has led to a high degree of cross fertilization across Europe. And the recent reform, the French reform, of our competition enforcement is in for the illustration of that. We had a, a, a system in France which was a dual enforcement system sharing responsibilities between the Ministry of Economy and an independent body called the Conseil de la Concurrence. We uh, observed that we were the latest in Europe to have that dual enforcement regime, uh, sharing responsibilities with the department, the government department, and an independent body. 
uh, there was Luxembourg and Malta sharing this um, uh, situation with us. Uh, Italy, Portugal, Spain and others had made their revolution earlier. And because in a network you can't be at ease if you don't share the same structure, we, we, we found ourselves maybe a bit isolated because we are different from the others. And that has been a key argument to change our system and to switch from a dual enforcement system to a single enforcement system with a new authority, l'autorité de la concurrence, having the whole range of responsibilities in the competition uh, area. Same, for example, on another issue, the direct settlement issue, and certainly there is a cross-fertilization between the European scheme and different national schemes which are experienced at national uh, level. So I strongly believe that the creation of a common culture of competition which has allowed the ECN to fulfill its initial objectives and go past such objective only five years after it was established. Um, if we um, try to um, assess that, I would say uh, on the uh, division of work and allocation of cases, uh, it has been very successful. The best place authority principle is accepted by all ECN members. The system of information is rather efficient, uh, and the figure uh, given by Alice is, um, well, convincing. More than 1,130 1, cases shared between the different agencies, among which 950 come from national authorities. Uh, 1,130 1, cases, among which 950 come from national authorities based on Article 81 and 82. Cases in which envisaged decisions have been notified, 374. And for example, the French authority has taken 173 amongst these uh, 374. So look, there is a real decentralization process. It's not about words, it's about reality. And a clear signal of compliance with this funding principle is that the Commission never had to formally withdraw a case from the hands of the NCA through the procedure of Article 11.6. It has been a friendly, I would say, network based on mutual exchange of uh, ideas, but not, I would say, a compulsory or very formal um, network. Second, I think it's very important. Uh, since this criteria of the best place authority was criticized at the origin of the ACN, it has a second advantage. It is, I would say, a no two stimulating criteria. It's sort of benchmark between us. If I want to take that case, I have to prove that, I have more, that I'm more efficient than the others to do it. And you have to think about uh, your weaknesses or your strengths. Uh, I am intellectually equipped to deal with the case. Have I uh, investigated the market? Do I know the market? Do I know the structure of the market? So, since uh, at the origin, maybe blurred legally uh, criteria proves very successful in the way it forces us to think about uh, how you can be more efficient to deal with the case. And I think that's really an advantage of that, uh, of that kind. Uh, on, on, on the side of mutual assistance and cooperation, I would like to uh, quote the French case, the air fuel uh, case, uh, where we, um, for the first time, used the possibility to require assistance from another national agency. It was a case where there were alleged uh, collusion between worldwide oil companies for um, refueling um, Air France planes in La Réunion Island. So we had a complaint from Air France and we were able to deal with the case and to make a decision where we find that worldwide oil company. I don't quote the names because you know them very well. Um, and we benefit from the network in two ways. First, Italy, the Italian authority, had a case, exactly the, the same kind of case in the Roma airport. So we, 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 the case Andrews went to visit the Italian colleagues, and because it was a very subtle collusion, they were able to understand what were the, the facts. Second, we made downrays in France and in La Réunion Island. They didn't prove a very successful. So we thought that maybe some evidence would be in the headquarters of the companies which were in London. 
and uh, the, 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 the French authority required the OFT to make downrange uh, in London, and it proved uh, successful. We got some evidence of the collusion in the tender, and we were able to find um, an infringement and to find the companies. The Paris Court of Appeal confirmed our decision, and it is the first uh, court decision on the use of Article 22 um, um, uh, of the regulation. And it, it's interesting because it makes a distinction, a distinction between the three steps. Uh, the, 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 um, the requirement from the national authorities to get the assistance of another one is subject to national law of the law of the country which requires assistance. The way investigations are made by the other national agency is subject to the law where the investigations are made. And the use of the evidence gathered in the foreign country is subject to the national law where you make the decision. So it's interesting because it's a mix of different national laws which are combined, in fact, to protect efficiency and the protection of fundamental uh, rights in the different uh, territories. Um, the ECN, besides, I would say, division of work, besides uh, mutual assistance and practical cooperation, um, there is, has launched a general trend of conventions of national competition rules on uh, substantive um, issue. I won't be very long because Alice mentioned a lot of things, and uh, I won't be. Um, I won't. I, I wouldn't like to, to repeat what he did. Uh, what, what, what he did very very clearly. Of course, the model leniency program has been a unique opportunity to widespread consistency in the way we uh, organize uh, leniency and certainly is um, a, a key element for the success of leniency policy uh, all over uh, Europe. But, and I would like to end my remarks by that, I think even if we have met success, there are three challenges we have to, uh, to face and to meet in the future. And uh, my, 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 the, the three challenges, I think, is, uh, are the following. First, is it possible to apply the same substantive rules without harmonizing due process rules and the way we make that rules effective in Europe? That's the first challenge. The second challenge is how to switch from a case enforcement network to a policy convergence network. I think that's the second challenge. And the third one is how we can duplicate the efficiency of the ECN to, I would say, judges and court, which review our national decisions more and more based on community competition law. First of all, and that is a question that everybody shares, can we effectively apply the same substantive rules in diverging at the same time on the process, on the structures, and more, 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 more worrying, on the instruments we use to make the rules effective. The uh, European Court of Justice, uh, late June, uh, gave a very important signal in a Dutch case. Um, I'm unable to quote it because it's in, it's in Dutch, and uh, it's a referral made by a Dutch court. But... Um, this, um, this ruling made on the 11th of June 2009 is important because the uh, European Court of Justice states that the effectiveness of sanctions decided either by community or national agencies is a key element of consistency in applying Article 81 and 82 in Europe. It gives us a signal that's, of course, important to be consistent in interpreting the law. But more importantly, we have to be effective in using the same instruments to make that rules effective. And to be very frank, there is no harmonization about that instrument, especially the, the way sanctions are defined, uh, the way we, we, we choose between, I would say, corporate fines or criminal fine or criminal um, uh, um, enforcement. Well, there is a, a wide discretion in Europe about the effectiveness of rules we apply together. And I think that the first challenge we can't be, uh, you know, successful in trying to, uh, to, to, to 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 foster convergence on substantive rules without being convergent on the way 
we are making that rules effective. Same for procedures. Uh, of course, there is a trade-off between efficiency and due process rules, but I'm really struck, struck as an observer by the, the wide difference between our systems in terms of due process laws. Ireland, it's a country where only courts can impose fines or, um, or a, for, for competition uh, offences. In France, or in many, in many countries, in many countries, uh, we have administrative enforcement with corporate fines, but a separation between investigation and decision in our system. Others don't make any difference between investigation and decision. So, isn't it time to think about procedural convergence? The second challenge, and I will be very short about that, <laughs> sorry, is about how to gain a policy dimension and promote policy convergence. Uh, and I think it's important not in term only in case enforcement, Article 81 or 82 enforcement, but advocacy on policy, uh, policy um, issues. And what are the tools today available for, to the ICN to come up with common advocacy uh, projects? Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a very important, um, important uh, issue, and I would let my written paper, my written remarks, to go further on. The, the, the third challenge, and that's not the least important of them, is how to duplicate the success of the ECN for judges and courts which review our decisions. I'm struck by the isolation of national judges reviewing decisions made by national authorities based on Article 81 and 82. And I think it's important because while we decentralize the creation of community law, of course most, mo most of it is now made by national courts national courts, and they have not the feeling to belong to the same network. So how we can regulate that network and provide consistency with it, that court network? What is very striking is the very limited number of amicus curiae which have been made by the Commission to try to influence the way national courts decide on community matters. 1,000 11 and 30 cases have been brought to the network, but there has been only four amicus curiae which have been sent by the European Commission to the national courts in order to guarantee the fact that what the national judges will decide will be consistent with, I would say, the common, um, the common building. And that's really a need for a, a more active coordination, should it be, I would say, the European Commission or the European Court of Justice, to widespread this common culture towards uh, national, um, national judges. I will end by two questions. First of all, the success of the ACN, could it be a source of inspiration for other community policies? Uh, is it limited to competition, or can it be transposed to other issues, and maybe regulatory issues, such as telecom, energy regulation? That's the first question. And second question, should we export that success to other regions of the world. I'm, I'm wondering whether what we have done couldn't be uh, useful for other um, countries in the world sharing, I would say, belonging to same, I would say, organizations, market or commercial organization, ASEAN in Asia, Latin America, Africa, uh, economies which are more and more integrated. I'm wondering whether what we have done couldn't be uh, maybe a source of inspiration for other regions of, of the world. And I'm very sorry because I've been, as usual, too long, and I must uh, apologize for, for that, for being long and certainly boring. Thank you very much. Um, yes, um, <clears throat> what I'm going to focus on is what I call in my notes European competition work network, the formal and the informal. I'm sure many of you who work in the area will, as listening to Alish or to Bruno will say, hmm, what about this, what about that, isn't that part of the network? Um, I start with the view that like any other group of entities with common interests, competition authorities talk. You've got to start with that proposition. We talk because we have common interests. But of course the form we talk is quite different from other fora that we are all in the Competition Committee of the OECD, or the International Competition Network. Those form, although they are formed for discussion of, of competition law, enforcement, and policy, they're all held in public, by and large. 
you can download, you can go on the website of the OECD or the ICN, you can find out all the work product. There are no secrets because we don't talk about secret matters. It's a, it's a form for an exchange of ideas. Now, I also should mention one body which we, we never talked about, but something to take note of. There's something called the European Competition Authorities, which is another network, which is a network of competition authorities in Europe, uh, including the competition authorities of the EFTA, Norway, Iceland, and Liechtenstein, and the EFTA Surveillance Authority, where they talk not only about EU competition laws, but also about the national one, as well as the merger control. So there's another body. It is active, but it's certainly not as active as the ECN. Now, what is the, f the formal structure? And, and Alice has covered much of it. Clearly, the ECN is more than a form just to exchange ideas, like the ICN or the, or the OECD. We know about the formal structure uh, being founded by Regulation 1, 2003. In fact, it's, uh, it, it shows up in, a, in Recital 15. You won't find it in the operative part, but it, it pops up in Recital 15 of Regulation 1. And what is the raison d'etre for the network? It is simply this, is that Regulation 1 created what is commonly called parallel competences of national authorities and the Commission in an application of Article 101 and 102. And of course, once you have parallel competencies, issues come up. And I can identify four issues that, that, that require some sort of coordination. Case allocation. Obviously, if we start a case and the Commission starts the case on the same matter, there's a problem. There's an issue about fairness. So obviously, that is what Regulation 1 deals with. Consistent application. And Alice has talked about uh, you know, notifying the network when you bring a case under 101 or 102, and when you're about to take a decision, you, you notify uh, uh, the network. Uh, there is a provision, Article 12 of Regulation 1, which provides for an exchange of information and discussion, including confidential information, for the purpose of applying 101, 102. So we were applying 102, for example. We can call the French authority and chat with colleagues freely without saying, oh, stop, I can't talk because this is confidential. We're completely free to talk. Then there's a formal arrangements for assistance. If, for example, the Commission requires our assistance with, with their inspections, commonly called the Don Raid, we are required to provide it. If we want to get the assistance of another NCA, such as France, they can choose to assist us not to assist. But there's a framework for making requests. This is what is called the Article 22. Now, if you want to know more about the network, there is a Commission notice that's published on cooperation in the network. And, and you can find that on, on the Commission website. But clearly the consistent theme in Regulation 1 is one of cooperation among competition authorities. Now what I want to now talk about is what's not part of the network. And the reason I want to highlight that is to show you that so much more goes on among the competition authorities in the EU, that includes the Commission, when I use the word competition authorities, than the ECN. There's a technical framework for the ECN. Um, cooperation existed before Regulation 1, and, and so much of cooperation exists outside the ECN. I mean, Alish has a certain uh, frame of reference for his job as head of the unit of the ECN unit. But, you know, as I st started out by saying, we talk all the time, and you can, there's not one single area of competition law enforcement, whether it's the national laws, whether it's the European laws, whether there's merger control at the EU level or the national level, that we don't talk to colleagues or the Commission. So, so I think it's useful often to think about the ECN as really just a name, a label, but really the, it's the total totality of the interactions. That's what's involved here. And certainly a lot of the comments of Bruno made is really is about all those interactions. We don't normally think each day that we get communications. We think, is that an ECN document or is that just a general consultation document? We don't think that way. There are certain formalities of the ECN network, but uh, we don't think of putting it, there's no need to pigeonhole it. Now, as, as Eilish always pointed out, there's something called the advisory committee. And I want to spend a few minutes here to, for people to understand that the advisory committee on restrictive practice and dominant position, which is the advisory committee for the purpose of applying 101 and 102. Whenever the commission brings a decision for an infringement, either anti-competitive conduct, or abuse of dawn position, before it adopts the position, it sends a draft decision to the advisory committee. The advisory committee is made up of all the members, national competition authority. We're asked for our advice. 
So we go there and say, do we agree with the commission, not agree, pick a comment. These are truly very secret meetings for obvious reasons. The commission is about to adopt a decision, and you know, we are seeking our advice. So that part is technically not part of the network because the advisory committee ex existed way back in an earlier regulation called Regulation 17 of 1962. But there's also another set of interactions here relating decision making. It is the oral hearing. For those of you who know the process, is the commission issues a statement of objections, the party responds, and then can request an oral hearing. That is basically, in, in, in the European context, an oral hearing is not a hearing in, in, in the adversarial sense and, and following the common law style of adversarial hearing. It's one where the parties can make presentations to not only the commission, but um, DG Comp, the, the unit that enforces competition law, but also the legal services, members of the cabinet of the, of the competition commissioner, other DGs that are interested, if it's an agriculture matter, it may be somebody from DG agriculture, representatives of each of the member states, representative of the EFTA. Now, third parties are entitled to participate. This is an occasion where the parties under investigation can make submission. Again, this is not part of the advisory committee, it's not part of the ECN, but this is a very important part of the interactions. Now, what else does it include? Of course it doesn't include national laws. Most member states in Europe, virtually all member states, have their national equivalent to Articles 101 and 102. That is not part of the ECM. Right? Um, that's important to know. Merger control, very, very important area. Merger control because of its origins. Europe, the EU did not bring in merger control until 1989. And the, the basis for it is not derived from 101 and 102. It is separate merger regulation. 139, 2004 is the latest version of it. And there, that brings in the EU merger control. But of course, 26 out of 27 member states have their own national merger control laws. 25 of the 26 have a notification system. And the outlier, of course, is the UK. They have a merger control law, but it's not part of the... Um, uh, a notification system, and the one who doesn't have it is Luxembourg. Now, there, there is a whole set of interactions. If you look at the regulation 139-2004, member states' NCAs are, will receive the most important documents when the commission starts a merger case, when they, for example, start what's called phase two. They issue what is called an Article 6-1-C letter. We get a copy of that. When they issue a formal statement of objections, we get a copy of that, and we get all the replies. So again, it's not part of the ECN, but there is our interaction. And of course, as you would expect, there is an advisory committee in that system, and which operates similarly. Before they adopt a decision, they consult the advisory committee. And as you also would expect, there is an oral hearing process, and it works very similarly to the oral hearing process for articles on 101 and 102. So we can see there that is extensive level of contacts in these other areas. Now, having said that, you will see so much of what goes on in the day-to-day -day interactions involves, for example, private actions. Uh, as you know, in Europe, there's been long-standing debate. There have been many, many, many discussions but they're not under the ECN. It's a commission initiative, but the member states, the NCAs, and including uh, uh, you know, our department, been invited, justice has been invited in different countries, participate in this debate, internal debate. But again, it's not ECN technically, but nevertheless, it is a discussion about the most important initiatives. Article 82 guidance. Again, it's not part of the ECN, technically, but it is, uh, uh, there, this is uh, the guidance or guidelines uh, 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 that the Commission adopts. They consult member states, and we have an input. So we went there and we debated with them, raised comments, and so forth. So that's a very important part of what goes on. No less important is the informal interactions. That goes on all the time. Nobody sits and logs it when, you know, we, you know for example, we're doing a study, I can call we're doing a study on something. We said, what do they do in, in Holland? We understand Holland has a similar system. What do they do in Holland? So we pick up the phone and say, okay, Dutch colleagues, uh, what is, how do you treat such and such? Or we pick up the call, uh, phone and call somebody at the OFT. Or even call somebody at the Competition Commission in the UK, which is, by the way, not a competition authority for the purpose 
of, of, of Regulation 1, but nevertheless a competition authority. So we have so many of these interactions. Of course, what, what, what limits it is the extent to which you can share confidential information. And this is my personal view. I think that in the course of talking to another authority, forget any waivers, if I need to share confidential information for somebody to comment, my view, again, it's pers my personal view, is one that one should be able to do that. It's quite different if I said, oh, by the way, French, you know, I've got this confidential information here. You might find this interesting. I just came across it. That would be quite problematic for me to just hand information, not for the purpose of my enforcement, just because I want to be a nice guy and get invited to the Autorité de la Concurrence. So, but if, it, if I were needing Bruno's assistance, but in order to say, well, Bruno, what do you think about X, and X is confidential, my view is that we shouldn't have no problem. And the parallel I draw is that when I retain a consultant, uh, Dr. X, to advise me on economic matter, I share with Dr. X confidential information, but of course for a specific purpose. So if I call Bruno and say, Bruno, I've got this fact, I'd like you to re uh, comment on it. By the way, you can only look at this for the purpose of assisting us. <clears throat> this is not something you could take and go off and, and use it yourself. So, that is the only issue. So in short, all this is about is, and forgetting all these labels, it only matters when you're trying to invoke certain provisions, is that we talk all the time. We're going to talk much, much more going forward. It's inevitable because of the nature of the system in Europe. Thank you.